I want to introduce, let's see how to get out of here. Hang on a second. I want to introduce our speaker, Dr. Jonathan Dalton. Dr. Dalton is a licensed psychologist who is a founder and director of the Center for Anxiety and Behavioral Change in Rockville, Maryland. He received his undergraduate degree in psychology from Villanova University, a master's degree in psychology from the Catholic University of America, and a doctorate in clinical psychology from Fordham University with a specialization in child and family psychology. He completed two years of pre-doctoral training at John Hopkins School of Medicine, Kenny Krieger Institute, and advanced postdoctoral training at the Maryland Center for Anxiety Disorders at the University of Maryland. He specializes in the treatment of anxiety disorders in children and teens with a focus on anxiety-based school refusal. He believes strongly in the importance of public outreach and frequently presents to student bodies, educators, mental health professionals, and community groups such as ours, we're very fortunate, on the treatment of anxiety and related disorders. And so with no further ado, or with no, however you say that, I will introduce Jonathan Dalton. Great, thank you, Pam, so much. Let me see if I can get my screen to share here. Okay, can everybody see that okay? Okay, I'm gonna take that as a yes. Okay, um, so <laughs> talking about the COVID era, um, I'm talking into a, a green light on my computer and not an audience that I really enjoy interacting with. So one of the things that, that I would love to do is to invite you to please ask questions in the chat. One of the moderators will um, stop and ask the question. That way there's no audio challenge, having multiple people try and talk at once. Um, but please feel free and ask questions. I have a bunch of slides, um, many of that I'll get to, some that I probably won't, but I can also deviate from these and I really wanna make this talk really tailored for the needs of the people who are in the audience. So I can only do that if I, if I hear from you guys what questions you'd like me to address um, or if you have any clarifications that you would like on any of the things that we'll be doing. As an aside, um, this talk is being recorded, and so um, if you do ask a question, please make sure that the information there um, is appropriate for public domain and that no names are, are being used. Um, so as I give this talk, I've, I've given talks about anxiety for uh, over a decade now, and this is a brand new experience for all of us living through a pandemic with quarantine and hybrid education and Zoom education and everything in between. Um, and so I'm gonna be tailoring today's talk for more specific things that we can be doing to help kids who are at need during the COVID-19 era. Um, that being said, I'm also talking to Chad, and so I wanna focus a lot on the fact that these are not just um, kids, they're students, and that this is a stressful time for anyone who is having to learn from home, and I have many ADHD patients, or many patients with ADHD, I should say, who um, are really struggling, obviously, with maintaining their attention in this new world with multiple distractions, being in their, their room um, often, and having all kinds of different things that are shiny and bright and are, are distracting, and that goes for the adults as well as it is for the kids. So we, I'll be talking a lot about ADHD as we, as we go forward, and the high level of comorbidity between anxiety and ADHD and why we think that's the case and why the kids who were more vulnerable before the pandemic are actually increasingly vulnerable. The gap is widening right now because of the more obstacles that are put in front of the kids who have different brains trying to learn in these non-conventional times. Um, I wanna begin when we talk about anxiety is to always begin with the really good news that anxiety is not a disorder by itself. Anxiety is something that is really helpful for us to have. It, its evolution has designed it um, as something really important to pass down because it keeps us safe. Um, and one of the things I'm always only half joking when I say this is that if you have a kid who's smart, creative, and compassionate, it always seems like the anxiety gets thrown in for free. Um, and that's a really strong positive. Let me see. Kathy, I'm, I'm good. I'll, I'll move it along as we go along. That was just a, a message from one of the moderators. Um, so, so it's really important that kids understand that, that rather than having it be something that's wrong with them, if they have a vulnerability for anxiety, it's really only the shadow cast by their great virtues of things like being smart, being creative, being empathic and compassionate. And the great news is that anxiety is very treatable. In fact, it's the most treatable by far 
of all the different mental health disorders. And when kids learn, kind of get the owner's manual for their nervous system, when they learn how to overrule fear as a decision-making tool, they're learning life skills, not just educational skills or what it's like to be a kid, how to succeed. We're talking about things that are gonna really produce in them knowledge they couldn't have learned any other way than by doing things they didn't think they could do, by doing things they were scared to do, by being brave and scared at the same time. And those are really important skills. I'm a firm believer that individuals who have an anxiety disorder who get appropriate care for it and learn these skills are really better off for having had the experience and learning these skills and never having it at all because now they are learning grit, learning grit and resilience. We're talking a lot about those two topics today in our, in our lecture as well as other things as we go forward. Okay. Um, any questions from anybody so far? I see something pop up. Yeah, okay, we're good. Okay. So I learned a tremendous amount from the kids that I work with. And so this is a, a quote that I often include in my presentations. It's one from, from one of my patients. He was a student who missed three years of high school because of an anxiety disorder that was very impairing in his life. And this was his first sentence of his college application, the essay. He said that having an anxiety disorder is like being stuck in that moment when you've realized you've, te you've leaned too far back in your chair, but have not yet fallen. And I think that really captures the experience of being in a really highly anxious state and how difficult it is to focus on much else other than what you're experiencing in that highly anxious state. So um, I had another kid maybe many years ago, maybe 15 years ago, and he was 12 and he had depression. And I asked him, um, he came up with that diagnosis previously. And I said, what's it like for you to have depression? Because it's always different for different kids. And he thought about it for a minute and he gave me the best definition I've ever heard, better than a textbook. He said that, for him, depression made his life feel like a stick of chewing gum that lost its flavor. It's both heartbreaking and so insightful all in once because we know the opposite of depression is not happiness, it's vitality. It's being fully alive. Um, so we always want to really listen to the kids and their experience. It's really important for us to understand that. I'm going to be talking next about um, just to give you some background about the level of anxiety that was existing among kids and teens prior to this pandemic. In other words, I want you to understand the water these kids were swimming in before this hurricane hit. Um, and there's limited data right now on what's happening in terms of kids' mental health during the quarantine and reentry phases of life, but we'll be talking a little bit about that as well. So before I, I get into the details about anxiety disorders, I want to talk for a minute about um, what makes an anxiety disorder a disorder versus adaptive anxiety because this is gonna be central to our understanding of what's going on because there's gonna be many, many kids who have high impairing levels of anxiety but are not having an anxiety disorder this year because it's a reaction to actual danger in the environment. So adaptive anxiety keeps us safe. It stops us from repeating mistakes. It's basically an alarm that goes off when it's supposed to. It doesn't have false alarms. So it makes a disordered anxiety disordered is not the intensity of the anxiety, but the goodness of fit for the anxiety to the situation. So we can all think of many situations where it would be perfectly justified to be in a very anxious state. If you were one of those people that had to be rescued by a helicopter um, because they were cornered by a forest fire, yes, you would be very anxious and you should be. That's not a disordered level of anxiety. And so it's really important, again, that we understand that Anxiety disorders are the equivalent of a false alarm, that the fear is real, but the danger is not. Now, the challenge of that is that you can't tell by the intensity of your fear whether the danger is real or not, any more than you can tell by the sound of your smoke alarm, whether you burnt your toast or the curtains are on fire. It's going to sound exactly the same, and it's going to feel the same in these situations. Okay, so we're talking about um, anxiety in today's lecture. It's really important that we do talk about the idea that there's going to be many, many kids who are very anxious, but justifiably so as they're getting into an environment that is frankly more dangerous than it used to be. And so we want to understand how to approach these kids in a way that's different from how we approach the kids who have generalized anxiety disorder or panic disorder or social anxiety disorder or one of the anxiety disorders that we know happen in far too many kids. Okay. Jonathan, may I yes. interrupt for just a second? This is Pam. Um, we are looking at your very first slide with the title, 
um, you may have you may be doing introductory. I just want to make sure that this is where you want to be in your slide. Oh, that's weird. Yeah, no. Um, <laughs> mine's on the, the fourth slide. Really? Yeah. Let me try that again. Thank you for letting me know. And that. if you if you click up on slideshow by animations at the top bar, it might open up the whole uh, see right there where it says parent right. You're almost there. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, play from start. Let's try that. All right. Is it moving? Um, not sure, but if you look at the top right where you clicked, it says slideshow in that little tab. If you click the slideshow, maybe that will start. Yeah. No, I did that. It's not. Okay. Not too weird. So right now we're on adaptive anxiety versus disorder of anxiety the slide right now. Okay. Well, that's really weird. That's never happened before. Okay. It's not moving. No, if you click on the slides on the, on the left hand side, cause we're looking at uh, the, the thumbnails. If you click on five, the, you click on that slide five for a second. Why yeah. is this so important? Yeah. I don't have that one here. That's weird. Let me stop sharing for a minute and try again. Okay. Right. Just let me um, also say, um, while we're figuring out this technical difficulty, that this is being recorded and you will all get a, the handout from this presentation. If you were able to um, sign up on and reserve uh, your spot on Eventbrite, we have your email address and, you, and this will uh, be sent out to you following the presentation. Okay, what, what do you guys see in there? It's the first slide again. It's still the first slide again? And it's staying on the first slide. Yeah, I don't even have it in presentation mode right now. Yeah, um, we're seeing that the thumbnails slides outline like numbered one, two, three, four, five is on the far left of the screen and then the other part and it shows all, uh, okay. all of your buttons. Okay, what about now? Same thing. Mm -hmm. Same thing. That is so weird. Okay, that's never happened before. If you were able to just click on the slide two um, with your well, that yeah. See, now we see intelligent, creative. I, you might just have to click the thumbnails and, as you. Okay, go. that's fine. I'll, I'll do that. Thank you so much. Sorry. Thank for, you. No, no. Thank you for letting me know. Sorry, I spent the entire time talking about the first slide. <laughs> uh, this is the one about the the patient who was stuck in the chair. Um, this is the disorder level of anxiety. Can you guys see what I'm pointing to now? Yes. All right. So I'll just keep it just like this. Sorry about that, guys. It's the the joys of doing Zoom sessions. Um, so, so again, what makes an anxiety disorder so important to understand is that it's a reaction to an appraisal of danger that's often inaccurate. It's happening in the absence of danger. The fear is real, but the danger is not. And it affects way too many kids and it affects them in pretty significant ways. So um, one of the reasons why I give so many of these talks is, is this information. Again, this is pre-pandemic that of all the different categories of mental health disorders, that anxiety disorders are the most common and have the earliest age of onset. So if someone during their lifetime is gonna have an anxiety disorder, about half will have it before the age of 11. So this is affecting kids very early on in life and it really profoundly affects their development and the trajectory that they're on. We know that um, between the ages of 13 and 18, um, again, pre-pandemic levels, about 8% of kids will have an anxiety disorder in that moment that they're being evaluated. But the next ones are what really grabs our attention, that about 32% of kids before the age of 18 will at some point during those 18 years have had at least one anxiety disorder. And about 8% will have a severe disorder that really interferes with their functioning. These are the kids that I love working with, have difficulty with daily living, like going to school, for example. And the girls have it worse than the boys do, like for a lot of things, I'll get to that in a minute. But one of the things that's so important about this is that only less than about one in five kid and, kids and teens who have an anxiety disorder get any care for it. And so we have very effective treatments that are tragically underutilized. For ADHD, it's 79% of those kids will receive some care for their diagnosis. And that makes sense. As caregivers of someone with ADHD, you understand how attention drawing the behavioral challenges sometimes can be. And so um, they get a lot of, of supports in place because it's easy to recognize those symptoms than it is to recognize anxiety. A lot of those kids, by definition, are trying to be chameleons who blend into the background. So if we look at about 8% of kids between the ages of 13 and 18 have at least one anxiety disorder, and then we look at it with ADHD. And we see that about 27% of kids with ADHD currently have at least one comorbid anxiety disorder. 
And so the very fact that someone has a diagnosis of ADHD tells us there's a greater than one in four chance that at the same time, in any given moment in time, they also have an anxiety disorder. Um, and so it's a much higher rate for anyone who has a learning difference, especially ADHD. And some estimates range, by the way, a lot higher than that. I've seen some estimates as high as 40%. But this is where the, the current study that I read is pointing it now at, at about 27%. Um, so these are things that are really important for us to understand. And kids often have a hard time really demonstrating their level of, of understanding or need about their own internal emotional experiences. So it can, it can manifest in behavioral terms, but it often originates with more of an emotional experience when it comes to anxiety. I mentioned before about how the girls have it harder. Um, so before the age of 18, almost 38% of girls will have at least one anxiety disorder. And that's 10 times the rate of what, for instance, eating disorders are for girls. So I just want to go through just how profoundly impactful this is for so many different kids. And as a, as a point of comparison, it didn't used to be this way at all. So there, there's some data um, that shows that teenagers today are between five and eight times more likely to show symptoms of an anxiety disorder compared to their same age kids did during World War II and the Great Depression. Um, we saw that depression increased by over a third in those nine years between 05 and 14, and it hasn't gotten a whole lot better. And it seems like every year, the college freshmen are having higher rates of mental health disorders than they were before. So this is something that we're calling it the age of anxiety for a reason, because the level of, of distress and impairment that we're seeing are really unparalleled in American history, in worldwide history, in terms of the number and percentage of kids who are experiencing this. And again, this is before the pandemic hit. And there's some data that shows that there's, there's obviously very high impacts of what's going on in kids' well-being for, coming from a number of different sources, whether it's having to, to adapt to being taught online or in a hybrid model to kids who are experiencing trauma, um, you know, fear of contagion. There's a whole list of things that are making this much harder for kids. But another reason why I give so many of these talks is this next slide here, too. I mentioned how tragically underutilized these, these different treatments are for kids with anxiety, but these are really treatable kids. Um, what they're experiencing, what, what they're suffering from are things that we know how to help for the vast majority of kids. And unfortunately, we also know what doesn't work. And so it's really important, whether you're listening in the local area or somewhere else in the country right now, that you understand how important it is to find evidence-based care for someone who's experiencing an anxiety disorder because we know what works and it, it really involves exposure therapy. If you're looking for someone to really help your son or your daughter who's experiencing levels of anxiety that's really interfering with their functioning and they're diagnosed with an with anxiety disorder, the gold standard is an exposure-based model where we help someone to use non-avoidance as a way to cope with it. I always joke that I have this problem that I run an anxiety treatment center, but I don't treat anxiety. You see, I don't have to. Anxiety is two things. Anxiety is temporary and anxiety is harmless. What I treat is avoidance and avoidance can ruin lives. And the great news is that if we can treat the avoidance effectively, the anxiety will die a natural death. And so one of the main goals in treatment from an evidence-based provider is decreasing the use of avoidance as a means of self-regulation of emotions in the presence of fear. Dr. Dalton? Yes, please. We had a question from the, uh, the audience. Um, and do we have any information on why this increase has happened? You were showing lots of percentage of this increase. Is there any information as, as to why? It's a wonderful question. There's some, some thinking behind that. No one knows for sure. Um, part of the thinking comes down to parenting skills, that during World War II and the Great Depression and all those other um, moments in time, parents were just frankly unable to cope for their kids. The kids had to go out and do these things on their own. And now we have parents before the pandemic who for the first time are able to snowplow in front of their kids to remove obstacles to help them to not feel distress. And we know that comfort and growth are almost always incompatible. The way we turn our blisters into calluses is by continuing to do things when it's uncomfortable. And so one of the theories is that we call it over-functioning parenting. Um, where parents are trying to remove distress from their kids. 
Um, years ago, we had someone come in and give us a talk to our practice because we were seeing a lot of kids with allergies and fears of um, all kinds of, of negative effects of their allergies. So we had an allergist come in and talk to us. And I asked that same question. I said, well, you know, when I was um, a kid, there were no peanut-free tables. There weren't all of these, these EpiPen, you know, alerts around the schools. What's changed? And she said kind of the same thing. We got too antiseptic. And so kids weren't being exposed to everyday levels of contagion. So they weren't tuning their immune system to be able to fight back against these things. And I think a very similar process is unfolding when it comes to anxiety is that kids are just not being exposed to it at the same levels they were before. So they're never getting tolerance for it in that way. On top of that, we see the effect of social media on kids. Um, the always being on, um, being tuned in, having the need for stimulation constantly. I think part of it is this race to nowhere, this misbelief, especially in this area, that somehow going to Stanford is a precondition for happy, meaningful life. Um, I see that happen all the time um, with families that I work with where kids have these false belief systems about the importance of going to a certain college. And by the way, there's no data that supports that. Um, in fact, the data points the other direction. It's the individual, not the institution that matters when it comes to that. I think in this area, there's a conflation or a confusion between achievement and self-worth, that leading a lot of kids to feel like they are the latest grade that they got, and so therefore they need to prepare and prepare and prepare because it's this sense that they, they are only as good as, as what other people say they are in comparison to other, other individuals. Uh, so I think it's a confluence of a lot of different forces. I think parenting and social media um, and the achievement orientation are probably the big three, but great questions. Okay, and everyone can still see what I'm doing. I'm still moving along the slides. <laughs> okay, please let me know if that happens again so I don't, I don't get stuck on the same slide. Okay, so let's talk about anxiety during the COVID-19 era and what makes it so different and what we need to be thinking about. Number one is it's reality-based fears. Um, I have gotten several referrals tragically in the last month from kids who are looking for services because someone they know has passed away because of COVID, whether it's a family member or the family member of a friend or a neighbor or something along those lines. I've had several kids have to watch their grandparents' funerals live online in the last month. So it's really important that we understand that there are reality-based fears. Now, thankfully, the fear among kids themselves having negative effects are much lower. I can't even imagine if it was in reverse, what we'd all be living through right now. But they're reality-based fears. We also know that, that anxiety itself is in many cases like an allergic reaction to uncertainty. And we have never had more uncertainty. I was talking with school systems across the country in the middle of August, and they didn't know what they were doing in terms of online versus in-person education. And that was two weeks before the beginning of school. Um, so we have all kinds of level of uncertainty. The one thing that we know is that we can't predict the future right now. We don't know what's going to happen this year um, with many different forces and, you know, going on right now with levels of enrollment, with um, teachers who might have to quarantine themselves, um, you know, all kinds of different things, which makes things just highly unpredictable. We also know that there's ongoing disruptions to routine. So usually we get in a new situation, like getting in the cold water and you, it's uncomfortable, but you get used to it. And then you can just have a good time and play around. Well, right now things are changing so much. So some schools are in hybrid, some schools are, are in person, some are, are switching between the two. Um, those of you who are in Maryland may be watching, I know there was a, the governor gave a speech, you know, right before school began saying, Everyone go back to school. So there's all kinds of potential ongoing disruptions that's going to prevent that habituation or getting used to it from happening. Um, so kids who are back in, in person, they're gonna have friends who maybe aren't in person with them, or maybe they're there some of the times. I mentioned trauma. I think this is a really important thing for many kids, not just those who've tragically lost someone they love, but those who have people in their family who are on the front lines, who are, you know, um, ER docs or nurses or cleaning crew or a grocery store clerk. Um, a lot of kids right now are very, very worried about their people and their family into a level where it's really approximating trauma for them. I also think that when we get back in person, classroom illnesses are gonna be seen in a very different way. So if a kid has a runny nose and a cough before everyone kind of laugh it off, no one's gonna laugh it off now. First time a kid coughs in a class next to you, how hard is it going to be to pay attention to what the teacher is saying if you think that you might have just caught something that potentially could be fatal? 
um, that's going to be really, really hard in that situation to be able to focus on retaining and processing new information as a student when you're having intrusive thoughts about people that are appearing ill in your surrounding. Other part of it is that as someone who, who really specializes in school refusal, or kids who avoid school because of anxiety, one of our primary goals for the last 10 years has been to keep those kids off of online education because it does make them much more comfortable. It's easier, they can wear their pajamas, and wake up later, they don't have to confront their fears when they're doing it online. Well now every kid in the country has experienced a high dose of online education. And so I think we're gonna see higher levels than we ever have before of kids who are saying no thanks when it's time to go back into the classroom because now they've gotten used to the, the ease and, and pleasure of not having to do as much um, facing their fears, learning from home versus learning from in person. Okay. I also want to talk about some emerging data that's coming out. Now, this is for adults. It's not for kids, but I think it's a good analog for what kids are going to be experiencing. So it's called the COVID stress syndrome or CSS. This is not a diagnosis. It's a syndrome. And there's a guy named Taylor. There's a, quote, there's a reference in the next slide um, that talks about what they have discovered in their research. And they found that there's five things that are really contributing to this COVID stress syndrome. Uh, number one makes sense, fear of physical danger, right? Contagion, getting sick. There's also the idea of the social economic costs, which we know are very heavy for many families to bear right now. And we also know that kids are much more intuitive and tuned in than their parents give them credit for. So many parents believe they're keeping these worries from their kids, but they're not. And so it would not be surprising to me at all if many kids are really worrying about social economic situations, many of whom may be doing so in silence because they don't, their parents don't know that they know. The third one was really interesting in the idea of the xenophobia, that worry about foreigners spreading the, the disease, which of course is irrational because Americans have the highest prevalence rate in the world. So basically anybody that we see who's not from America has a lower rate of contagion by percentages than we do, but that doesn't mean that it's not there. And this is an important thing to keep in mind because when we're working with people that may look different or sound different or have parents from a different place, there is some concern, and I think it's justified tragically, that kids who look different when we get back into online classes may be feeling more alienation than they have previously because other people who are not informed may view them as a risk. And so I wanna put that out there because that's what the data says. And it's really important that we try and combat that with education for all of the kids to try and prevent that from happening. But the data suggests that there is a likelihood that when we get back into in-person classes, there is a chance for kids who have a different ethnic background um, or are first generation Americans um, to be somehow shunned in some way. Um, the fourth one is the traumatic stress symptoms um, that go with people that have had a diagnosis. I know several people that have recovered from it um, and are experiencing significant anxiety that comes with that. And then the compulsive checking and reassurance seeking. That might be watching the, the, the news repeatedly or checking things online or asking people um, about things repeatedly. And so the research found that about 16% of Americans um, have this to a degree that it warrants clinical intervention. Um, what's really interesting about this as well is that they found that the pre-existing condition of an anxiety or mental health disorder was a much stronger predictor than level of vulnerability. So it doesn't really matter as much how vulnerable your age, about any of those things. What this is telling us is that an individual who already has a predisposition to experiencing anxiety or related disorders is much more likely to show this high level of distress related to COVID-19. So those of you with kids, I'm guessing a lot of you who are tuned into this talk, have kids that you think are vulnerable for anxiety, which means they are also more vulnerable for experiencing anxiety related to the COVID situation that we're in. All right, well, what do we do about it? Let's get into the nitty gritty here. The three C's. So as we're all in some degree of quarantine, we want to look at these three C's. We want to look at continuity. We think it's really, really important as kids do better with structure, especially kids who have poor executive functioning skills, comorbid with anxiety, um, is to have some kind of continuity to make things look as similar to before as we can, or to make the days seem like they're structured 
in a predictable fashion. So having um, meal times at the same time, having a, a schedule and a calendar that's readily viewable for kids so that they can have some degree of continuity with what came before to what's going on now and to keep it as continuous as we can. But the second one I think is even more important. The more I do this work with kids and teens, the more I keep coming back to this word of connectivity. That we already have known for, for a generation that perceived social support is like vitamin C against depression and anxiety. And we've never had a greater need nor more obstacles to connecting with people than we do right now. And so, yeah, we can do Zoom hangouts and we can have drive-by birthday parties and we can do these socially distanced play dates and we can do these things, but they are still not the same thing as what kids are used to. There's still an approximation of our needs to be connected. And so looking for creative ways to connect um, is I think really, really important. I know a lot of people are doing that right now, but um, really trying to balance out the need for safety with the need for connectivity and finding ways to do that. So I know a lot of schools are having social pods where they, they might meet on campus every couple of weeks or once a week just for social connection. Um, we think that is very protective against many of the mental health effects of the extended quarantine and isolation that many of us are going through. The third one is creativity, which to me is, is in two different forms creative in the sense that we have to face frustration with creativity, right? That we always tell the kids that frustration is the birthplace of creativity and we can't do the same things we used to do. So what do we do? We innovate, we create, we do things in a different, more thought out way in order to make these things happen. But the other part of creativity is the acknowledgement that for all of human history, we have an instinct to express ourselves when we're in hard times. So the more that we as parents or educators or caregivers can find a way to facilitate that level of expressive creativity, whether it's creative writing, photography, dance, um, you know, art, drawing, um, whatever it may be, having some outlet for kids to really help manifest that creative instinct. Um, we think that that, and the research shows that, to be a pillar of resilience during difficult times. Let me pause for a minute. Any questions from anybody so far? Okay. No, okay. Not, not so far. Okay, terrific. Okay, thank you. Okay, so what can we do for the kids who are experiencing these high levels of anxiety that's not necessarily linked to an anxiety disorder that's really due to the situation that we're finding ourselves in right now? And all of these things are true, but only more so for someone who has ADHD as well. The first thing is we want to build education. And we want to help kids to understand what's normal to be feeling. So I have several patients who have ADHD right now among different age ranges who are feeling down on themselves as we're beginning school because they have a hard time connecting um, or paying attention during the, the lectures. They have a hard time with being able to build the asynchronous time to an effective level. Um, the time just goes by and they're unaware of it in that way. So giving them education about the idea of what they're experiencing, how it's a normal reaction to the situation, and how we need to adjust their expectations and their understanding of what they're going through right now. I was talking with one of my patients who's a big baseball fan who happens to have ADHD and an anxiety disorder. And I, I talked to him about, well, what would happen if you were a, a pitcher in the, in the pros and you get traded to the Rockies where they're at a mile high and the air is much less dense. So there's a whole lot more homers that are hit out of that ballpark than other ballparks because the ball just goes further. Well, if the, the pitcher didn't know that and they're getting a lot of homers hit against him that year, he might think, wow, I've, I've lost my touch. When the reality is the environment has changed, not him. And I think it's really important for those individuals who are experiencing this, especially those with ADHD, to understand that distance learning, asynchronous time, all of those things are almost tailor-made to play to their executive functioning weaknesses. That has not changed their skill set or who they are. It's changing the environment that they're in. And we have to contextualize for them what it is they're experiencing. Number two, resiliency. We'll be going through resiliency in more detail in two slides. And resiliency is bouncing back from hard times. It's a coping well um, with, with difficulty, or as I might call it, suffering well. Um, the third one is learned optimism. Um, there's a guy named Seligman who is famous for creating the term learned hopelessness, or I'm sorry, learned helplessness. And now, he, you know, after that, he decided to look at positive psychology and 
coined the term learned optimism. And so we now know that optimism is not a trait or a characteristic, it's a skill that can be taught and can be practiced and can be learned. And so it's very important and as we're facing this uncertainty to not face this uncertainty as an evidence of a negative outcome. There's research that shows that anxious individuals tend to respond to uncertainty in the way that others respond to perceived danger. In other words, they are perceiving uncertainty as a danger in and of itself, which gets to the next one, which is increasing a tolerance for uncertainty, allowing it to be there to demonstrate how you're already tolerating uncertainty in other areas of your life. And here's how you can apply that same skill set in this situation. The next one I think is hugely important, which is building self-efficacy. That's a, a fancy term. All it means is how confident someone believes or th thinks that they can be in coping with a stressor in their environment. Let me give you an example. So if a, this is the one I use to the smaller kids I work with. Let's say that, that you're a bird and you're, you're standing out on a, on a branch, on a tree somewhere. You look to your right and the branch close to the tree is starting to crack. Well, are you going to not feel anxious because you can think of all the reasons why that branch is very strong and unlikely to crack and break? Or is it because you know you can fly? Right? One is self-reassurance, which doesn't work at all, which is reason why the bad thing is unlikely to happen. And the next one is knowing that you can cope with a negative situation effectively. In other words, you can fly. And so as we're facing this level of uncertainty, I think it's vitally important that these kids learn that they can fly and that they have talents and abilities exceed their expectations for this, from themselves, okay? And then I mentioned the cultivating creativity and flexibility. I always think of flexibility as anxiety's kryptonite, and never have we needed more flexibility than we do right now in this situation, from educators, from professionals, from the kids themselves. I think that we want to talk a lot about flexibility, and if you wanna get flexible with your body, what do you do? You stretch. If you want to get flexible with your mind, what do you do? You stretch it. You do things that are out of your comfort zone. And so by, by so doing, the comfort zone expands and you're much more able to embrace the experience you're going through in that situation. Okay. Okay. Let's talk about, um, about stress and anxiety. You know, what, what are these terms, in, as a matter of fact? Well, I think of anxiety as more of a future-oriented um, apprehension that's tied to a perception of potential danger, where stress is based on the demands currently being placed on you. And so a lot of kids will say, I feel overwhelmed. And what they mean when they say that is their stress is too high. They're not worried about what's going to happen down the road. They're much more stressed that I can't do everything that I think I have to do right now. And that is particularly true, again, of individuals who have poor executive functioning skills. It's hard to estimate how much time something's going to take or how to organize and scaffold themselves in a way where they can accomplish it and chunk it together in that way. And so we tell all of the kids that when you feel overwhelmed, well, that's a feeling, right? Um, on Tuesday, yesterday, I, you know, it felt like a Monday all day because I wasn't at work on Monday. It didn't mean it was Monday. It just felt like a Monday. Feeling overwhelmed doesn't mean that you are overwhelmed. It just means you feel like you're overwhelmed. So it's important they have those experiences. I, um, I hate that word normal. You know, what is normal besides the old saying, it's a setting on your, on your washing machine or your dryer. Normal is an idea that kids who are experiencing a pandemic, who are experiencing a reorientation of what education even means, when they have executive challenges, executive functioning challenges that interfere with their ability to access their curriculum, that maybe some of their accommodations aren't nearly as effective as they used to be, as true of a lot of the kids that I'm working with right now, at least, that they understand that that's um, an expected outcome in that situation. It doesn't mean they don't need help with it. You know, if you lose a lot of blood in a car accident, it's normal to go into shock. It doesn't mean you don't need assistance. It just means that's expected when that happens which means that we wanna review the appropriate coping skills. What are some things that we can do? And I'll be talking about those in a few minutes. Okay, let's talk about resilience. Um, I know you're getting a copy of this, um, so please don't, don't, feel, don't need to write every single thing down here. But the importance of resilience, this is what the data tells us about ways that we can foster resilience among kids and teens. 
And the APA, the American Psychological Association, has a great resource online. It's called The Road to Resilience. There's handouts for teachers or for educators. There's one specific for teens called Got Bounce. There's some for different ages um, for younger kids. And it's really important that we look at these things here. And if we think about some of the things we were talking about here, we've already covered them, like connections, structured and routines, um, self-care is a really important thing. And as, as parents, by the way, one of the greatest gifts you can ever give your kids is to model self-care. It is so hard when we have someone who has, um, you know, who's neuroatypical in some form, um, who has a difficult time and parents want to do so much for them. And I can so understand and relate to that. And yet, the best thing that a kid can get is to have someone else model for them a balanced life and taking appropriate self-care, not selfish. That is one of the greatest gifts you can give them in that way. Um, the optimistic outlook, uh, nurturing a positive self-view, self-efficacy. These are, are things that are so important for us to prioritize with our kids. Just like we want to prioritize the academic information, we want to break this apart as much as we can work with kids to figure out how do we include these in a structured way in someone's kind of intertwining it with someone's life in a way where it becomes almost second nature for them that they're doing these things. Okay. When it comes to learned optimism, they have this um, ABCDE in terms of, of the acronym for it. Um, but really it's that you have something bad happen in adversity. Um, the way you think about it, the belief you have, will directly affect the consequence of the adversity. So if you are seeing something as a challenge that you can't wait to roll up your sleeves and get to work on, you have a very different outcome than you will if you're thinking about it as something that's you know, um, too high of an obstacle to overcome. And so if you have a negative belief, if you catch yourself doing that, first of all, congratulate yourself for noticing that you did that. And then we want to dispute that belief. You know, these automatic thoughts that we have, they're like the kid who raises his hand first in class. Just because he or she raised their hand first doesn't mean they have the right answer. It just means they were first in line. The same is true with our thoughts. Because it occurred to us first does not make it more accurate. It just makes it first in line. And so once you can realize that you can have a different point of view, that you don't have to believe everything that you think, then that, what they call, energizes you and you begin to feel more able to, to com, um, complete the activities you're doing. So one of the common threads across all the different kinds of anxieties that we work with is a complicated term but an easy concept. It's called overvalued ideation. And all that means is people tend to think their thoughts are more important than they actually are. When we can observe thoughts, see them as events that are happening, like a stomach growling or an itch, we start to see them as what they really are, which is fundamentally inconsequential, that you don't have to um, act as if that belief was true. In other words, you don't want to confuse thoughts with evidence. They're very different. We, we want to look at real evidence to see if our belief is accurate or not. And the more that we can practice this skill and say, well, maybe that assumption I have about this bad outcome, maybe that's just a thought that I'm experiencing right now. What are other ways of thinking about this in that same situation? What would an optimistic person be thinking right now in this situation? Then we're able to distance ourselves from our own automatic negative thoughts and we're able to teach ourselves and learn how to be optimistic through practice by doing these things. Okay. When it comes time for uncertainty, it's really important that we look at the idea that we all tolerate uncertainty in all areas of our life. I have three kids I love desperately, but I don't know if any of them are still alive. I haven't talked to them in a few hours. And I'm perfectly fine saying that. I don't need to run to the phone and make sure that they're okay because I don't overvalue that thought. I see it as something that it's possible but highly unlikely, and so therefore doesn't warrant my attention or focus. And so we get in the car. We don't know if we're going to arrive at the destination that we're seeking to go to, and yet we still get in the car and we drive there. And so it's important that we understand that that certainty has always been a mirage. You know, I think of it like, like trying to grab a handful of smoke. You can see it, but you can never grasp it. And so once we come to the realization, as uncomfortable as that might be, that we've never had certainty about basically anything, then we come to the, to the realization that the only way to cope with uncertainty is to accept it. 
because we can never get rid of it. And so that means that we still pursue our values. We still do the things that we care about very deeply, even in the face of uncertainty, because it's all we've ever done to begin with. And we know that the more that people respond to uncertainty with radical acceptance, mindful awareness of the uncertainty and the anxiety that comes with it, rather than trying to seek that, that certainty, which is never gonna happen anyway, the more that we're developing skill sets, the more we're turning those blisters into calluses because the kids are much more able to say that I don't need to know for sure that this is good enough for me um, and that I can tolerate the uncertainty. I'm strong enough to sit with this emotion without feeling the need to get rid of it, if that makes sense to you. Okay. Feel free, by the way, to jump in with questions. I'm just talking into a, to a green light again. So feel free as we're going forward to, to ask questions here. Okay, let's talk about self-efficacy, right? That, that story of the bird on the branch. Well, how do we build that? Well, the good news is that we know the answer. And the way we do it is that we foster these things that I have listed below. The first one is a mastery experience. We know that a kid who feels highly competent in one area, and this is true of adults, by the way, too, whether it's a sport or in school or in, as a musician or as a babysitter or whatever it may be, when someone believes they have a level of expertise and performance in one area, we know that is very predictive of resilience, of all kinds of positive effects. It's what we call it a protective factor. The next one are vicarious experiences. If it's much better to watch somebody do something that they didn't think they could do and they managed to accomplish it than it is to watch the expert do it. And so what, I, what that points to with parents is, like I was saying before about self-care, it's true also for coping out loud. When we have um, a situation where kids often misperceive their parents and believe that they've never had these kind of challenges or difficulties in their life, when parents are able to share appropriately, of course, with age and, and you know, developmental level, the challenges that they face and how they overcame them and how hard it was and the skills they needed to develop to make that happen, those vicarious experiences of seeing somebody else, even by a story, overcome something has been shown to build up a child's own self-efficacy themselves that maybe I can do it too because they often have a belief that others can do it because they find it easy when that's not true at all. The third one is verbal persuasion. This is the, the, um, the coach in the locker room trying to get the kids to believe in what it is that they're trying to accomplish um, by, by making them feel like I can see something in you that you can't see in yourself. Um, we, this is where parents and coaches and teachers and aunts and uncles and everyone can play a really important role in this is to say simple things like, I believe in you, and I believe that you can cope effectively with this situation, whatever it may be, and to be with them when they do it. And that level of persuasion is a great way to show them evidence that their thoughts were wrong, they were incorrect, that you could do that thing you didn't think that you could do. And the fourth one is emotional states. Um, we know that people tend to be much more willing to do something if they feel like really um, into it in that, in that moment, which is why you know, the, the great coaches that have time talk, they're not just talking in a, in a calm, deliberate voice, right? They are trying to arouse an emotional state so people can believe in themselves in that way. And the research shows that works as well. Let's talk about grit. Um, I'm a firm believer that struggle is pregnant with purpose and meaning, right? Um, that when kids struggle, that's how they grow. When your child is struggling, you get the front row seat to growth occurring. And so what we want to do is that we want to foster passion and persistence. That's kind of the shorthand definition of grit, is that you care about this and you're not gonna let obstacles get in the way. And they'll get in the way, but you're gonna find a way over and through them if you need to. It's more predictive for success, how we define it, than talent. That's what really matters. Um, and unfortunately, there's not a lot of data right now on how to foster grit. How do we teach grit? So my thoughts on this is that we give the kids a situation 
where we set them up to do something they didn't think they could do. I'll tell you a personal funny story. When I was a freshman in high school, I ran cross country. It was by accident. It's an embarrassing true story I won't get into. But I ran cross country. And the very first meet, uh, I was way out of, my, out of my league. And I was this little 110 pound kid. And I was going up this hill. And these people that designed this course put the finish line at the top of a big hill, right over the hill, right over the crest of the hill was this finish line. And um, so I figured, all right, I'm gonna give everything I have. I'm gonna sprint up that hill. I'm gonna collapse over the finish line. I have the whole weekend free to myself and I never wanna do this again. And I've never forget this in my life. I, I crossed that hill and I had one of the worst realizations I've ever had. It was the wrong hill. And I figured there's no way that I can keep going. I probably had a half mile left to go. I totally underestimated how long the course was. And I was telling myself, I can't do this as I was slowly jogging down the hill. And then it got to a flat area. Now I was being passed left and right. Believe me, I wasn't the strongest or the fastest one that day. But I finished the race when I didn't think that I could. And I wouldn't have been in that situation if it wasn't for the circumstances that allowed me to do something I didn't think I could do. And that knowledge began to make me question the limits that I had placed on myself. And in other situations, whether it's studying for a major exam or something else, I learned that I could do things I didn't think that I could do. And I learned that by doing it. And so the more that we can foster opportunities for kids to do something that is hard, I think that we give them the opportunity to develop grit in that way. Okay, how much time do we have left? Okay, so let me go through some very specific things that I want you guys to have, and then we're gonna open it up for questions um, as, as we go along through this. Okay, um, number one is we want kids to be able to talk to themselves like a good coach. We want them to be able to have these, and these are just examples, there could be a thousand of these, um, in their holster, so to speak, so that when the time comes and they're really in a highly anxious state, that they can coach themselves through it. These are not reasons why they shouldn't be afraid. These are reasons why they can persevere in the presence of anxiety, that we can be anxious and, and the and is life. Um, I, I asked a girl last year who missed a couple of years of school, I said, finish the sentence for me, I can be anxious and, and she said, I can be anxious and strong. I said, great. I asked another boy who was a little bit younger and I said, a different day, what, what can you, how can you finish that sentence? And he said, I can, be, I can be scared and brave. I said, great. Then I asked another guy who'd been in this a lot longer, he'd been more experienced, older teen, and he said, I can be anxious in any damn thing I want to be. And that's the point of this, right, is to convince ourselves to persist in the presence of fear, to not use avoidance as a means of self-regulation. So the idea that fear itself is temporary and harmless, scary thoughts can't hurt you. Just because you feel like you can't do it doesn't mean you can't do it. You're stronger than your fear. These are the things we want kids to learn and develop is this repertoire of skills to be able to talk to themselves that being anxious is not at all incompatible with pursuing your values, the things that matter to you in your life. As long as we don't avoid as a means of dealing with a disordered level of anxiety, we win and the anxiety loses. The avoidance is the lifeblood of the disorder. Okay, so it's really important that we talk about those skills. We want to talk about the idea that when you feel anxious, again, your instincts tell you like the kid on the beach to run to shore, but the wave will catch you from behind. The best thing is the most counterintuitive of all things, which is to dive directly into the wave and come out the other side. When that happens, two things are the result. Number one is that you now know you can do it. You know it works and you can do it again, self-efficacy. And number two, you can stay out there and you can have a lot more fun now. So it's self-reinforcing that you don't have to stay as close to shore anymore. You can go and explore and, and really do the things that you care about at a much higher level than you have before. Um, let me go on to the next one here. Okay. We want to teach the kids this idea as well. That I want you to imagine for a minute that you're on a trip to New York City and it's not a pandemic time. This picture now gives me stress when I look at everyone crowded together <laughs> in New York. Um, but let's say you're up there and you're at the observation deck. It's a beautiful day. You're having a good time. And out of nowhere, the fire alarm goes off. It's this blaring, loud noise, and you don't know what it means. I guarantee you that if you're like most people, you'll be at a seven, eight, nine, or 10 out of 10 level of anxiety. 
trying to understand what's going on. A lot of intrusive thoughts about 9-11, fires rising on a top floor, and what we would all be thinking about is what we call an urge to flee. How do we get out of this situation? How do we avoid this situation? How do we escape from this situation? Now, I want you to imagine the same scenario, but this time there's an announcement. And they say, this is the superintendent of the building. We're here with the fire marshal. There's been some problems with our fire alarm system. We'll be testing it in the next half an hour. If it happens to go off, please disregard it, and we'll announce any real emergencies over the loudspeaker. Okay, you shrug your shoulders. You mostly forget about it. 19, 20 minutes goes by, and the alarm sounds. Well, you'll still jump out of your skin because you weren't expecting it to go off right then. If you're working in the building, you won't get much done while it's going off. If you are a tourist, you'll be irritated and annoyed it's going off while you're there. But you will not have that kicked in the gut, high level of anxiety married to an urge to flee, even though it's exactly the same alarm. The difference in this example lies not in the alarm, but rather in what you think the alarm means, or more importantly, what you think it does not mean. And the same is true when it comes to kids' anxiety alarm going off, is that we can't tell by the sound of the alarm if the danger is real or not, but we can help people to think differently about what the alarm means or more importantly, what it does not mean. Right? There's no off switch for these kids' alarms, but by helping them to better understand and contextualize what the alarm signifies and what it does not, we're able to fundamentally and profoundly change their experience of the alarm going off. This is where the education is so important for kids to better understand the nature of their thoughts, to not overvalue their own thoughts, and not to, um, to seek ways to avoid as a means of self-regulation. Now, let me go back to something here. Um, we know that, again, these are students and not just kids. And we know that working memory, just for those of you who might not know what the term means, if I ask you for your phone number and you give it to me, that's, that's long-term memory. If I give you mine and ask for it back a few minutes after, that's short-term memory. If I ask for yours backwards, that's working memory. And is highly susceptible to anxiety of all the different processes. Um, we also know that intrusive, scary thoughts compete for limited resources, like having too many windows on your computer open at the same time. We know that things that are threatening are prioritized. If I told you, hey, don't worry, um, but there's a gas leak nearby, but just hang out, it shouldn't be a big issue, you probably won't be able to focus on what I'm saying because you're thinking about a gas leak. And of course, fatigue occurs more quickly. Now, all of this is amplified when someone has ADHD. When someone's experiencing this level of anxiety, they have um, more limited working memory capacity by and large that it's harder to resist the temptation to follow the intrusive thoughts down a rabbit hole. Um, we know that it takes much more effort to stay focused. So the fatigue already happens at a much faster rate for those kids than it does for other kids. When you add anxiety to the mix, it's, it's almost unfair because the fatigue will happen much more quickly and we'll see much more irritability. And of course, fatigue leads to poor attention, poor emotional control, all the other things that become a downward spiral that we often see. And so it's really important that we see this as, as something that is also impairing. And it's important for teachers to understand this too, that if a kid is really worried about something or someone, they're gonna be much less available in those moments to retain the information they're getting from those places. Okay, let me talk about a couple different things that you as parents can do, and then we'll open the floor up for questions. Every behavior is functional. That does not mean that it's appropriate or, or a good thing. It just means it's not random. It serves a function that underlies it. And so anxiety, um, I want you to think of anxiety itself as a dog begging for food. Only it's not begging for food. It's begging for attention and avoidance. Now, when one of my dogs is begging for food at the table, it might be very tempting to say, oh, you drive me crazy. Fine. Here's a big piece of my steak. Now go away and never beg again. But of course, we know better. You know, the dog will leave just momentarily and come back asking for much more and will be barking louder and longer next time. And the same is true when it comes to anxiety. The paradox of this, and it gets every parent, can, you know, it's, it's so counterintuitive. And we, the research shows that 99% of parents, so everybody intuitively gets this wrong, that offering reassurance to an anxious kid will help them. It does not. 
it teaches them to seek your proximity as a way to deal with anxiety. And so we don't want to do that. Um, if we facilitate avoidance, we're asking the dog to stop begging after we gave them food. If we go through a lot of attention and say, well, it must be really hard, and we focus a lot on um, hugs and um, ice cream or things like that, when kids are anxious, we are training their brain to exhibit more anxiety over time. It's not a conscious, deliberative, manipulative process. It's brain training at a very base level. And so what do parents do instead? Well, this next slide will show you in the sense that no good parent's gonna go to this kid who's having a problem with this assignment and say, well, the answer is 12. Well, why wouldn't you? Because he'd get it right. Well, you wouldn't because he wouldn't learn how to solve the problem. And yet almost every good parent will give the kids the coping answer. And so what do we do instead? Well, there's all kinds of research that shows that just lowering what we call family accommodation, so not facilitating avoidance or um, allowing kids to have side benefits of exhibiting anxiety, that we treat them like a quarterback, we, we throw the ball to where they, we want them to be, not to where they currently are. And that if we reduce what's called family accommodation, the anxiety will diminish dramatically. Some research shows it's as effective as working with kids individually in therapy is just teaching parents how to not accommodate the anxiety disorder. So what do you do? Well, number one, you validate the emotion. It sounds like you feel blank, scared, worried, stressed. You wanna teach them how to use the right words to label what they're feeling. And then you want to say, well, what can you do when you feel that way? In the same way that this dad might be saying that to that kid in that picture right there, is that you're not giving them the answer, you're teaching them how to solve it by asking the right questions and leading them to the answer, okay? Another way of thinking about it is this. Let's say that you're terrified to fly and you went a trip to Hawaii and so you decide to go on it and you're halfway over the ocean and the plane's bouncing around in the turbulence. And you're gonna look around you. You're gonna look around and see how everyone else is, is looking. Are they as scared as you are? Imagine the first scenario where the seasoned flight attendant says, everyone please remain calm. The wings are very firmly attached. We're gonna be just fine. This is just rough turbulence. Buckle up, we're gonna be fine. No need to stress, okay? That's offering reassurance. The second, same situation, second scenario, the flight attendant says, um, ma'am, would you like tea or coffee with your lunch? Again, one is offering reassurance, which validates the need to ask for it and strengthens the anxiety over time. The other is modeling non-anxious arousal. It's much more effective. And so when your son or your daughter is exhibiting a lot of anxiety, the best thing for you to do is to adopt that bank teller, do you want tea or coffee mentality in response to it? Or saying, it sounds like you're feeling really anxious right now. What can you tell yourself or what can you do when you feel this way? That will make you less reinforcing, make it less likely for them to do it again in the future to get that reaction from you, again, at a brain-based level, and also will help them to pair the anxious arousal with the search for internal coping skills, which makes them more likely to use it in the future. Okay, the last slide that I'll show you is this idea of watering the seeds, not the weeds with your attention. Your attention is your child's paycheck. They will work harder for your attention than basically anything else on the planet. What that means though, is you wanna be exceptionally careful what you pay them for, because what you pay them for, they will repeat over and over again. So the best way to change behavior is to look for the weeds that you can cultivate, I'm sorry, the seeds you can cultivate with your attention, with all of those wonderful attributes that you as a parent has, and to deny the other things, the, the weeds, those very same things. And if over time, you can selectively water the, the seeds and not the weeds, what will happen? Well, the weeds will wither and the seeds will grow. And that is the foundation of how we help anxious kids from a parenting standpoint, is that we care too much about them and their future to be feeding the dog, right? To be giving attention or enabling avoidance for the anxious kid. Because the dog will never go away when you keep giving it food when it barks. And the same is true for the child's anxiety. It's really important that we know that um, anxiety by itself is not traumatic. Kids are much more resilient than we give them credit for, and that we can teach them by watering the seeds. Now, that being said, 
you know, it's different when kids are dealing with real things. You know, if a teacher is out sick because they have COVID and your second grader is very worried about them, rightfully so in some circumstances, then I think we're much more deliberate in what we're talking about. Again, because those are not disordered levels of anxiety. Those are things that we want to teach kids. What are some things you can tell yourself when you're worrying about that? And that goes back to learned optimism, to self-efficacy, and so forth. Okay, so um, let, me, let me stop there um, and open the floor. I'm going to stop my share. Um, open the floor up to, to questions as we go forward. Okay. I am going to unmute people to see if anybody has a question, Dr. Dalton. Yeah, what other ways can schools support kids in connectivity? Good question. Um, I think that what, what schools can do in that situation is to have more uh, of their classwork designed for kind of collective learning, where kids are doing things together um, in a shared way. I love the idea also of giving people the idea of, are right, we going to break into breakout rooms and on Zoom? And um, I want you guys, to, this is an example, you know, to talk mm -hmm. to each other about your summer vacation, what you did, and then have somebody else write a short story about what somebody else had done. Um, and have that be the assignment for that day of um, working as much as we can to have um, structured time where the kids are interacting with each other. Um, I think that the specials like music and art are more important than ever before. And so having people talk about what they've created, um, showing their artwork to each other, again, age appropriately can be very different for high school versus elementary school, but finding ways to, um, to have the kids do shared work together. Um, and I also understand this is, you know, an approximation of, of what it would be, um, you know, if they were all in person in that way. Um, yeah, that, that's a, a brief answer for that one. Can, can you give your thoughts about um, the schools now, their kids are in pods, they can't go into other classrooms, so they're not switching classrooms. Um, and so it, teachers are coming into them or teachers are teaching them from a computer in another classroom. Um, thoughts about that? I, I think that, um, you know, obviously it's, it's very challenging and those situations will be changing over time. Um, I, I think that in those situations, the more that we can have the teachers kind of model like coping self statements or being able to talk about their own emotions, like Mr. Rogers said that feelings should be mentionable so they can be manageable. I think that having um, built into the curriculum, having some specific information for kids to learn about how to, what, what does the research tell us about effective coping skills? Not just, this is what anxiety is, but here's what you do with a scary thought that you have. Here's what you do when you feel like you can't focus because you're having um, something else on your mind in, in that situation. So really um, kind of intertwining that with the basic curriculum for each of the kids so that they can learn, like in, for instance, building resiliency, having that be part of a, of a lecture um, for kids and talking about um, and sharing with each other, like here's what I do for self-care, here's what I do um, for time away from work, here's what I do when this happens in that way. And so kids are sharing more of their experience because connection isn't just like doing things together, but it's also about feeling like you're in the same boat in some ways. So there's, um, so having other kids just kind of talk more about their experience and having teachers. I think they're exceptionally well positioned to talk about self-care and what they're doing to make sure that they're connecting with their friends and making sure that they're not engaging in bad habits or avoidance or procrastination, those kinds of things. Thank you. We don't appear to have other questions, Dr. Dalton. This is Cheryl. I have a question. Sure, Cheryl. Um, I was wondering how, how, how people can incorporate exercise to relieve anxiety, because I know that helps a lot of people, either running or doing weightlifting or something like that. 
Great question. Interestingly, the research shows that lower body workouts is more effective than weight training is for depression and anxiety. No one quite knows the mechanism of action for that. Um, but I assign that, thank you for bringing that up. I assign that to my patients all the time. Um, that, I did that today, actually. I, I assigned somebody like a prescription 40 minutes of walking every day. Um, so I think that's one of the, the, the main challenges of a lot of schools right now is that kids are just not moving the way they used mm -hmm. to move, whether they're home or they're in the classroom, like what Bernice was just saying, where, where they're not leaving the classroom as much, that's a, a really challenging um, situation. So the more that we can harness that, I know a lot of schools are, are using curriculum-based things to be doing things at home, um, you know, of, you know, whether, whether they're you know, calisthenics or whatever they may be, the more that we can facilitate that, certainly the better it's gonna be. Dr. Dalton, we do have a couple of other questions that oh, just great. popped up on chat. Throw them up, yep. So one of the parents is saying that my son is avoiding talking to his professors about his accommodations. Seems that he does not want to talk to them over Zoom. Um, he just emailed the note to them. He was okay before COVID when he did this in person. Online school is enabling avoidance. How do I get him to understand that he needs to talk to his professors? Yeah, I see that so often mm -hmm. right now. Um, I see so many people of all ages, college students on down to kindergarten, mm -hmm. who are afraid of being on the screen. And for a lot of people, it's afraid of seeing their own face as they're talking to other people. It can be distracting or they might be having a lot of intrusive thoughts about the way they look, different things like that. Um, and, and you're right, this situation is creating an easier time for those people with social anxiety to avoid in-person communication. Um, and so for some people, it's the reverse, right? Where it's much harder in person and about half it's harder online in that way. I think what it comes down to is to talk about whatever we do, we're getting better at doing. And if you are pairing this anxiety with a creative way to avoid it, guess what? You're gonna have a really comfortable but shrinking cocoon that will limit you over time. So I think part of it is to have kids be able to really understand the limiting nature of the use of avoidance and talking about the idea about we, you can be anxious and still move forward because the more that you do that, the more that skill becomes in the kind of de facto go-to response of dealing with the anxiety in that way. Um, but it's a very, very typical problem. For a lot of our kids, we're doing um, exposure therapy where we have them doing something with us in person first, where we have a stern look on our face or, or whatever we're doing on the Zoom call and then we slowly transition them to doing that um, on, you know, online um, with a professor or a teacher. We have plenty of kids who are afraid of being seen on camera. So we begin with them kind of like this, where they can see their shoulder. And then we slowly, over the course of a few days, move it so they're more visible. Um, so it's kind of a shaping protocol where we slowly enable them to do it over time. It's like getting in the water slowly when you go to the beach in that way. Thank um, you. Got one more question here. How can a child learn to ease anxiety over time? For example, he knows he has an assignment, but automatically assumes uh, it is going to take an hour to complete when in fact it's a 10 minute type of assignment. So this is, is so unfortunately typical of individuals who have ADHD, that being able to estimate time is a very, very big challenge. And so in that situation, what, um, it depends on the age range. So I just had, I, I sent an email to a teacher today asking them for, for one of the kids I work with to have them write down an estimation of how long it's supposed to take for each assignment because he often feels overwhelmed by the assignment without realizing that he can actually do it relatively quickly in that way. Um, I think the other part of it is that um, for many of these kids, the initiation phase is by far the hardest part of it. And so it's kind of like getting a piece of furniture into a room. The hardest part is getting it through the door and you can kind of walk it in once you get there. So giving kids the assignment of writing one sentence for that paragraph or doing just something very, very small to help them to get over that, that first initial avoidance. And once they do that part of it, they usually realize that it's actually is much easier than they assumed and that they can get the whole thing done in the extra seven minutes it takes. And so just kind of reducing down the, expectations to the very initial um, part of the assignment can be very helpful. Thank you. And one last question. 
this uh, attendee is asking, can you go over how to validate children and the bank teller response? So great question. So how to validate that is to basically use the reflective listening that it sounds like, and it could be that somebody has a fear of something that is totally ridiculous. Like I have a patient who's terrified of tornadoes to the point where he's been hospitalized for it. And we know that that fear is grossly out of proportion, but that kid feels like they're really in danger in that place. And so we want to meet the kids where they are emotionally, that there's no wrong emotions to feel, that we can meet them there in that way. Let me give you an example. So one of my really good friends, he's a teacher, so I think he's naturally good at this stuff. And he was visiting, he lives overseas, and was visiting a few years ago. My daughter, who was seven at the time, was playing catch with his son with a ball they'd gotten at the airport in football. And my daughter managed to throw that ball directly into the little opening of a gutter that went down below the street and got swept away. And it was an unbelievable throw, I mean, one in a million throw. But her face, when she saw what she had done, and she knew this was an important ball that they had gotten in New York. And so she came over to my friend and said, I'm really sorry I did that. And she had tears in her eyes. And he, instead of saying, like, it's okay, he said, I can tell you're really sorry, and I feel sorry too. But I also know that we can get another one when we're back there, right? So you, you reflect back what you're seeing, right? Um, you because the kids don't often have language to just to even know the emotions they're feeling in that way and then at that point you can redirect them to an appropriate coping skill um, but the validation just means that it's okay the way you're feeling right now and this is what I'm seeing from my point of view of what I think you're experiencing that's what validation is the bank teller tone of voice just means that um, Lowering expressed emotion. We know that kids who are vulnerable for, aid, for anxiety and things of that nature, they have a hard time processing emotional content, especially from a parent. They just shut down. They don't hear it. They hear the affect. They don't hear the words. So when kids say, stop yelling at me, it's got nothing often to do with the volume of the voice, but the tone of voice. And so the bank teller tone of voice just means that we are intentionally lowering our expressed emotion to make the content that we're giving more available for the kids to listen to and to learn. Otherwise, they're blinded by the emotion of the person who's experiencing it. Thank you, Dr. Dalton. Um, I think that we're getting ready to close the, uh, we have a few more minutes. So if, uh, I'll just say if there's any quick questions um, right now, um, jump in. Um, so I'll wait a second here. All right, well, thank you everyone. Thank you, Dr. Dalton, for this very amazing and fascinating um, data packed and, and um, presentation tonight. It was either gave a lot of different wonderful suggestions for how to take the anxiety down and understand what anxiety is for young people. Um, so I thank all of you for coming tonight um, and being on this call, on this Zoom thing. And uh, as I have said, verbally, but also uh, chatted with a few attendees. Everyone will receive the recording of this presentation. And also, uh, Dr. Dalton, uh, would it be, we'll be sending out a presentation, uh, the slides perhaps for follow-up, if that works. Sure, I'd be happy to do that. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you again, everyone. And please, if you have any questions, reach out to um, Chad, and we'll be happy to answer them. But uh, you'll be getting that material soon, but probably by tomorrow at the latest. Thank you so much. Thank you guys. Thank you. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Thank you.